Hi, I'm Dreadware. I'm here with Jordan Casper, and I'll try a brief introduction and keep me honest. Okay. Um, okay, so you have been in open source software for quite some time and a, a solid contributor too, but for the past eight years, you've been working in government with the DOD and Department of Homeland Security, um, doing a number of uh, like, uh, like advising, um, different advising tasks for teams and also writing policy. I have been, yeah. Is that correct? Yeah. I'm, I'm the easy spot to fed because I'm actually like wearing the elbow. <laughs> elbow so. That's wonderful. Um, can you tell us a little bit about how the government's utilizing open source software at the moment? Yeah, I mean, I think um, if you think about the number of IT systems in the federal government, the number of agencies, both on the executive branch and then you get to the legislative branch and even in the judicial branch, we have hundreds of thousands of IT systems. And I would argue that every single one of them relies in some way on open source software. So pretty big consumers, yeah. And you said something that definitely stuck yesterday about, um, you know, that, that consideration of um, rights and ownership. Right, so when we're talking about the publication of open source software by the government, which I firmly believe we should be doing more of because the software written for the people was paid for by the people and we should let them see it. Um, most of the time, federal IT systems are written by contractors. And the way that our contracts are structured is that the government has full rights to use that software any way we want, including publishing it as open source. However, we almost never get the copyright signed over to the federal government, in part because the federal government actually can't own copyright within the bounds of the United States. It's a weird nuance of uh, patent and trademark law. So we don't own the copyright. So if we force a contractor to open source it, they're releasing their intellectual property rights. And so there's a, there's a weird balance there where we could publish it because we have the full data rights to publish it. But if we ask the contractor to publish it, the people that wrote it, well, if we just ask them to do that blindly, they could easily say, no, that's our intellectual property. Sure. So there's some contractual issues that we would have to work through for that. And, and it's a really interesting nuance. Um, but at the same time, uh, there's the flip side of the coin, which I know you might ask me in a second, but there's the consumption part. And there's also actually a intellectual property slash license issue there because it tends to be the case that government officials don't understand how open source licenses work and whether it's legal or not for us to actually use open source in our systems. Uh, uh, the short answer is yes, we can. That is awesome. And it sounds like a place for quite uh, spirited debate and discussion and arbitration. But while that occurs, let's say hypothetically, I'm like a software engineer, a government contractor in the position to kind of act on what you were talking about. Um, also, you know, someone who's interested in uh, DEF CON, something like a little bit outside of the, the box. Um, so with someone in that role, how, how do you visualize that they yeah. can kind of utilize that? Yeah, so I, I, I've been, I haven't been on the government contractor side uh, and, and that is maybe important, maybe not. But as a government employee, my advice to government contractors doing IT development is to frankly just do better. Um, it is too often the case that a contractor is doing the minimal they need to do in order to consume open source software. And so you'll see oftentimes uh, people blindly pulling in open source packages from some package manager, NPM, PyPy, Maven, whatever you, you, you use, and with almost no checks. Uh, they're letting individual contributor developers decide, yes, I'm gonna use that package. Now the government scans our systems, but oftentimes we miss the open source packages because they get compiled in, because we don't, we aren't able to isolate an individual open source package uh, necessarily because we're not doing that, that open source consumption properly. And so, you know, uh, contractors can help uh, both the government, but also the American people to secure the systems that we rely on by implementing some of the best practices for open source consumption, things like using a mirror, things like uh, having better selection processes for open source, um, and honestly, contributing back. You know, when we fix the security vulnerability, give that back, push that back upstream, which is absolutely not the case in uh, the majority of, of the time. And that was a light bulb moment when you were uh, giving a, a great example and just uh, talking about 
I mean, permission, like even just knowing that you can go and make a pull request if there's a, a piece that you that you find, and um, that that was something that was pretty surprising to me. I mean, because I, I don't even know that I could do that. Yeah. Or how? The, there's the, there's the permission side, and then when you talk about again all of the systems being built by contractors, there's the. Uh, uh, the, 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 the permission, like security permission, and then there's the funding permission. Sure. Because the government is paying these contractors to build a system. And generally speaking, on the government side, you find a lot of people that say, well, we're not paying the contractor to fix someone else's code. Sure. Right? The upstream repository. But here's the thing. We have to fix the bugs and the security holes and everything in the upstream library for our own stuff. We just don't require the contractor to push that back up. So there's the permission to do it kind of from just a security process way. And then there's the permission to do it from a, will the government actually pay the, the contractor to do that work? I guess the third uh, like realization was like the individual permission. If someone sees something, you know, how long would it take to make that pull request or even just, you know, send it out like, hey, maybe look at this. Right, and so one of the things that I think is, uh, is really important is for, uh, there should be some kind of checks and balances there on the government side, but I think there needs to be a little bit more of a broader permission of saying, hey, uh, uh, you know, government IT program and contractor, we have reviewed how you interact with open source libraries and because you have these processes in place, you kind of have that blanket permission to, yes, you can push uh, open to PR upstream and yes, we're, because of the processes we have in place, you don't have to get every single one of those contributions reviewed by privacy and security and program management. You can just do it. Um, and, and that's not something that happens in the, in the federal government. Uh, I've never seen that in a in a sustainable way. It, it seems like the the thought there, I guess, to, for me to summarize it and place it somewhere is like in a nutshell, like a rising tide kind of lifts all boats. And by doing that, you're actually in, investing in making things a lot more secure. And yeah. it's actually a pretty low cost investment because the developers are already yeah. working in the code. They're already fixing the bug. Yeah. It's already done. Opening the PR shouldn't be that much more. Now, I will say that when you push up a, 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 a fix, a bug fix, right, to yeah. an upstream repository, it's not just the code fix. Oversimplification. It should be obviously the tests and the documentation and and um, possibly even uh, some kind of informational, uh, so you'd have a regression test, right, you'd have the bug fix, you might have some documentation on that, and then there's going to be some back and forth. Uh, maybe you have to add or change a configuration of a security scan in there in the upstream's uh, continuous integration or something. You never know. All those additional steps is obviously more work that sure. Again, the government has to pay the contractor to do. And so I think there's lots of opportunity for that. Um, uh, again, kind of once you have that good process in place of, yes, I can just do this. Uh, it, it, it takes time. It takes um, willingness yeah. on the part of both the government and the contractor. Or it requires some force from the government side sure. to work that into the contract. Actually have it in the contract that says... No, you contractor, anytime you do a security fix on code that is not yours, that is an upstream repository, you must contribute it back. Don't make it optional. Don't just write it into the contracts. Then they have to. And it, it sounds like, uh, I mean, even something like a short, I don't know, you were talking about a pilot program and they've tried other pilot programs. So, it, you know, something like that wouldn't have to be like. You could, sure. absolutely. So when I was at DoD, we had a contract that said basically those things. Um, it was a relatively low dollar contract, which is why we were able to push those envelopes a little bit more. Yeah. Uh, the delivery of that IT program, so in the actual contract where it says, you know, contractor, you must deliver X, Y, and Z. In most cases, it says, you know, you have to deliver the software and this and this and this. And a lot of times in the past, not as much now, they delivered that software on CDs or DVDs. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, that actually happens. Um, the way we start, and, and that's not as much now, now they're working kind of in our systems, but one sure. of the things that uh, we did on that contract is we said that the delivery was by open source URL. Hmm. So they had to push all the code onto GitHub. It had to be open on GitHub, couldn't be closed. And it had to have 100% of the things needed to be able to run that system. So the software, obviously, the tests, the CI infrastructure, the cloud infrastructure as code, all of the documentation, all of the design artifacts had to be in that repository and delivered as an open source repository by default to start. And you know what that does? It sidesteps all of those privacy checks and security checks that the government would impose in an administrative way because they had to set up good processes to be able to deliver it as open source in the first place. Hmm. So the security approval was the process before any code existed, not 
after the fact where now security has to review all of the code, all of the design artifacts, all of the infrastructure artifacts, and then privacy has to come in and review all those things, and then program management has to come in and review all the things, and then make a decision to approve to open source. That sounds like an awesome case study. So there is a good example of this happening in a post facto way in terms of they designed, developed it, and then open sourced it, and that's the IRS direct file system. Um, they were able to get that open sourced. It took them over a year for that process to happen. Um, whereas, obviously, the contract of the DoD that I worked on, uh, it was open sourced right away, right? But so, you know, if we want to do more of this, which I believe we do as a country, as a government, um, I think there's a lot of levers we have to pull, uh, modifying our contracts in small ways maybe doing some pilots and testing those out. And honestly, just seeing how they go. Like you, you have to try something, you have to start somewhere. Right. That sounds like a really cool modernization effort too. Uh, bad news for uh, uh, CD burners. That's right. Um, but uh, when was your first DEF CON? Uh, I came a few years ago. Um, I, uh, when I was working at the, at the DOD, uh, I met a uh, longtime goon who actually runs the policy at DEF CON uh, room in Village, um, uh, Roro, and uh, we were working together, and he knew that I was kind of into board games and, and puzzles and things like that, and uh, he's like, hey, you should, you should come out and design a, a CTF for us. I was like, I don't know what you're talking about. And uh, uh, he, he pulled me in. Um, I did not know what I was getting into. Uh, I still don't know what I've gotten into. Uh, but now I do, I actually design. So I'm here speaking on open source software, but I'm also running a CTF for the Policy Village, which is where my talk came from. Um, and, uh, and I've done that now for a couple of DEF CONs, and I do it for another conference that we have in DC called District Con, um, which is another hacker conference, a little bit smaller, uh, that happens in DC every year. So uh, that's kind of how I got sucked into this environment. That's a uh, that's a lot this year, but it sounds it pretty is. fun too. At the same time, it is. It is fun. Um, I, I enjoy it. Uh, the The amount of interesting people you meet here is is unparalleled. Uh, just sitting around and people walk up and have conversations. I, I think that that's one of the most interesting parts of DefCon is that people are very open to just having conversations about anything, any topic. You can sit there and put up a sign that says, hi, I'd like to talk to interesting people and I guarantee you, you would get people every five minutes coming up and talking to you, guarantee That's not a bad idea and that's also in, in the DefCon ethos, you know, that handwritten, yeah. you know, tape sign to yes. the backpack. Yes. Um, so you, had told me a story yesterday too about uh, facing a few issues while speaking, and you handled them quite elegantly too. So, do you have any advice um, for first-time speakers or someone that so what he's talking about runs into my, an issue? In my talk, they did not have a projector and screen for my slides; they had a digital display. How modern of them! Unfortunately, that digital display did not actually connect to the HDMI cable at the speaker podium for some reason, or the cable is bad, or who knows. So instead, I had a giant yellow lit board behind me and no slides for the attendees. Um, one of the things that, that, that so I've been speaking for uh, many years. I was a developer evangelist for three or four years, um, and and have done uh, hundreds of events. Um, I've done things in all sorts of different environments, uh, and the things that I've learned is one: you've got to keep your cool and realize that the people are there to hear you talk. They're not there to see your slides. Uh, they're there to hear the information from you directly. They could always just go read a blog article or watch the video after. No, they're there to interact with you and to hear you. Um, and, and you should be confident in, in, in that. Um, and the second thing is uh, um, being able to just roll with those changes. So in my case, I make sure that all of my slides are always on my domain, jordancasper.com. So uh, you, I, can, I always know where those are gonna be. And I can always say, okay, everyone, uh, go to jordancasper.com, in this case, jordancasper.com slash OSS dash in dash gov. Relatively simple to get mm -hmm. to, and everyone could then pull them up on their phone if they wanted to follow along with the slides. Um, and making sure that you have that backup. In my case, I always have those slides online. I have them locally on my computer. Uh, I have them as a PDF. Uh, um, I have so many different ways. So having backup plans on backup plans. I've actually presented from my laptop like showing the slides from my laptop. At a, um, all Things Open in uh, Raleigh, North Carolina. It's a great conference, you should check it out. Um, all about open source things, uh, where the day of my talk at about 8 a.m. we lost power uh, for a seven mile radius around the campus of North Carolina State. And I presented from my laptop to about 20 people who decided to stick around. Oh man. Yeah. So you've uh, definitely done it off the cuff a couple of times. Many times. Um, so 
you said that I can file my taxes on GitHub. <laughs> Uh, IRS direct file is in fact posted on, di on GitHub. Um, the entire system is there. Uh, but yeah, direct file is a great way to file your taxes. Um, we don't know its future state right now. It's a bit in flux, so we'll see what happens. Um, but it was a really great system. Uh, it is still, it was used this year, it was used last year, and uh, we actually had someone in the crowd that had, had used it, which I, I think that was great. And uh, that was a part of, uh, a number of like open source repositories that people could find. Um, yeah, there's a great site. Um, now this one is just about GitHub repositories and obviously people are on GitLab or Bitbucket or other things, but uh, government.github.com, great site to go and just see what's there. There are, just by that tracker, 164 federal agencies or organizations that have a GitHub presence. That's awesome. And there's tons of code out there. There's code out there at the state and local level as well that you can find on that site. Um, and uh, the list of those is actually open source and you can submit a pull request if you happen to be a government employee and have a GitHub organization that's not on there, submit a pull request to their to their uh, repo so that you can get that added. And uh, I've done that with a couple of organizations that I saw were not listed. That is super cool. Yeah. Well, thank you so much for yeah, talking to me. It. Yeah, it was a lot of fun. Thank you so much.